incredible India. What a great joy it is to be back here once again. Nowadays I live in the United States of America, but I actually come from a very, very small country called Ireland. Um, and we have a very proud association with um, India. In fact, just down the road from where I grew up, there's a convent. And many, many years ago, there was a young nun from Albania who came to Ireland, and she was there for a while. And they said, you can't use the name that you were and And one day they said, we think we should call you Teresa. And Mother Teresa got her name from a little convent just down the road from where I actually come from. We're also very proud today of another association between Ireland and this great country in that just recently, back in Ireland, we have appointed the youngest prime minister in all of Europe at 39 years of age, Leo Varadkar, um, who is half Indian, um, who's a medical doctor, and whose father came from India. And so we're very proud of that in terms of not only a great Indian being our new prime minister, but also in terms of the rich diversity that is the modern Ireland. Um, I'm not sure why you or you or you got into this business in the first instance. Well, believe it or not, that's me a long time ago. The picture on the left is me as a 20-year-old television presenter back in Ireland. The photograph on the right is taken when at the age of 22. It was a shot taken before I went to cover the Olympic Games in Moscow in what was then the Soviet Union. For all of you who are under the age of 35, the instrument in my arm is actually a telephone. But during that time that I was in journalism, I dealt a lot with public relations firms, and I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly of PR firms. And it was a belief, arrogant or otherwise, that I could do better, that I'd a better understanding come perhaps of how the media worked than some of the companies that I was dealing with. And so this was my first step as running my own small PR firm back in Ireland at the age of 23. So we all come into the business from different perspectives, whether from university, from in-house, from academia, whatever it might happen to be. We all arrive here in and, uh, different ways. And, and, and the story I'm going to tell today is to talk a little more about, we've heard about it in the first presentation, first conversation, uh, talking about the ethics, about the importance of ethics in our business. Then I'm going to tell you a little story um, about something uh, that happened to me completely out of the blue about seven years ago, and something that I had to deal with. Um, and then I'm going to go on and talk a little about some trends that we may be seeing uh, in the coming year. Does anybody here, here recognize this particular gentleman? Well, if you don't recognize him, I'm sure that you'll have heard his name at different stages of your life, and you certainly have heard his music. That is Van Morrison. And Van Morrison gave us great, great songs along the way that Have I Told You Lately, Brown Eyed Girl. And of course, his movies has been featured in so many iconic movies over the years, ranging from Sleepless in Seattle to the diary of Bridget Jones. Perhaps the music has been used in as many as 40 or 50 particular movies. Well, I got to know Van um, over the years, and as a particular friend of his uh, wife. And um, at the end of 2009, back in Ireland, I was online in the period just coming up to the end of the year, and I was going through some uh, financial news, and I got onto the BBC, and I saw this story. And essentially, the story was saying that Van Morrison had just become a father and, and talked about the lady that he had just had the baby with. The only issue was that the lady involved was not his wife. And this story was breaking all over the world. Um, so I said to my wife, I said, this is really bizarre because I'm not aware that they've had any breakup or any issue or whatever. So I, she said, well, you, you better say something. So I sent his wife a, a text simply saying, are you okay? And later on that evening, she came back to me and she said, why wouldn't I be? 
And this story was breaking everywhere. Now, Van and Michelle were known to be a very reclusive couple and hard to get to. So anyway, I had the not particularly joyous task of sh sharing the news with Van Morrison's wife that there was a story going around that he just had a baby with somebody else. And that this story was getting worldwide attention. In fact, it was being covered in approximately 2,000 publications around the world. So she, naturally enough, was a bit upset. And over the next day or two in conversations with them, they told me the story was a complete and utter hoax. There was no truth in the story whatsoever. And they asked me, as a friend, would I help? And so I spoke, among others, to the likes of the Associated Press. And the Associated Press in Los Angeles put out a note to all their subscribers that they should correct the story. So the story was the Guardian, Van Morrison blames baby announcement. Baby announcement. And so this story then was carried by about 2,000 publications around the world that there was no story. There was only one problem that emerged, and that was within the next couple of hours. I started getting bombarded from media in various parts of the world to say, this is crazy, he does know this lady. He does know this lady. Now, Van had told me himself very in very colorful language, that not only did he not know this lady, he had never, ever heard of this lady. Huh? And then I'm told later on, in fact, her name appears on some of his companies, and he does know her rather well. So the story started, started to take, that's actually just a cutting from uh, the New York Times. And then we, we move on a, a period of time, um, and it gets all very murky and very, very complex. And it's, it's covered by lots and lots of newspapers. And then Van takes out what's called in the UK a super injunction to prevent news speculating as to what might have happened here. And in the course of doing that, one of the newspapers in the UK informed me, informed me that, that he was saying that I had said things that really were not the truth. So now my reputation was on the line and it was becoming particularly uncomfortable. So spool on and I go to court to give my version of what had happened and Van then is forced to lift the super injunction. Now it becomes crazy with the newspapers and so now I'm featuring very prominently in the story. It's not just about him and the baby. I'm Scott, I spoke to Van a short while ago and I said, did you know who this person is? He said, I've never heard of her. And then uh, the lady involved is saying, I am good, the baby is beautiful, we were barraged with press at my house. As some Irish idiot, that's me, had Van make a statement that is false, off people off now, it's made my life so, so much worse for me. Then in April 2011, I'm saying, I was totally bewildered, never mind compromised professionally and personally when it subsequently, when it subsequently transpired that Gigi Lee was in fact Van, but as a member of his commercial entourage. But much as I tried to get Van Morrison to actually exonerate me, he simply wouldn't budge, he wouldn't do anything. I understand he was a man with lots of problems. There was a further extraordinary twist to this story because Within just a couple of months, the baby died. And then a few months later, this lady died as well. As people say, you just couldn't make it up. Um, but uh, the story was rumbling on, and still he wouldn't exonerate my role in the whole thing. So eventually, I was forced to go and start taking action over it. The newspapers are revealing Van the Liar, um, and the famous song, Have I Told You Lately? And um, again, I'm featuring in the story. And then it got to a point where even the newspapers were suggesting that in an upcoming court case, Van's wife might possibly give evidence against her husband in my favor. Um, cut a long story short, I didn't want to do this, but I was forced to go to the end. It got settled out of court. You can see a headline there, Van lied to PR man over paternity. I ended up getting substantial damages, all my legal costs paid, um, and also a letter from...
from Van Morrison saying that I had at all times behaved in a professional way. And I felt this was really important to do, not just for myself, but also for our profession. Because as my mother has always said to us in Ireland, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And if I didn't address this at that time, I believe that forevermore, my reputation was going to be in question. So I took reputation to protect my reputation because in the end of the day, what do any of us have other than our reputation? So building a positive reputation, both personally and professionally, will always be reliant on establishing a, a pattern of sound ethical behavior. Uh, being seen as the kind of company or person with whom others might want to do business. That's why an, insistent, an insistence on the highest ethical standards in every aspect of the work we do as a, the core of Fleischmann Hillard's guiding principles. Our worldwide reputation hangs on how we approach the ethical responsibilities we have to not only our clients but also our, our employees parent company, shareholders, and the communities in which we live and operate. For our clients, this means acting with honesty and integrity in all aspects of our relationships. Everything from respecting and protecting confidential information to establishing clear, agreed upon goals and budgets. For our employees, we have an ethical imperative to foster a culture of creating respect for the individual creating an environment where we interact with each other and all external audiences openly and transparently, where diversity is not just a buzzword, but is actually a critical component of our long-term success. To our parent company and its shareholders who have invested in us, our ethical obligation includes management of fiscal responsibility, which extends to recruiting and retaining the best people in order to achieve the greatest opportunity for success. To the communities in which we live and work, we're committed to working responsibly as advocates for our clients' interests while fulfilling our obligation to foster public dialogue and debate. We hold ourselves of accurate standards of accuracy in the information we disseminate and we are accountable for our actions. We also support these clear activities and pro bono work that are central to the social welfare, education, economic development and quality of life in the cities where we live. This past year, in an ongoing campaign called FH for Inclusion, we committed more than two million dollars in time to social inclusion projects throughout our world, from helping migrants to literacy programs. In the industry, Fleischmann Hiller developed a program called, called Ethics as Culture, a resource guide and full training module designed specifically for public relations firms to bring renewed attention to the importance of ethical business decision making. Once that program was ready, we donated it to the PR Council, an organization made up of more than 100 of America's leading communications firms, so that any member firm could repackage it and use it to foster a culture of integrity with their own organizations. We strongly believe that having a solid foundation of unbendable ethical principles is essential to our success. For communications companies, those guiding principles also serve as a compass that we use constantly as we navigate and help define the ever-changing course of our industry. Challenges are never in short supply on that journey. We must be constantly looking ahead and trusting our principles, experience, an intuition to chart the right path. And just when that map has been drawn, the landscapes shift once again. And 2018 is going to be no different. We must match our values by staying ahead of new trends. So as a way of starting a dialogue, we at Fleischmann Hillard have put together a short list of forces for you that we'll be watching in the coming year, with some statistics and examples to support each of them all of which have great potential for impacting the way we operate as communicators.
First, I'll talk about corporate citizenship. The companies people choose to support or work for are increasingly an extension of an individual's personal values. And consumers now expect companies to go above and beyond mandated regulations and actively address societal issues. Today's most influential executives will not only be expected to be captains of their enterprise, but also senior statesmen and stateswomen in society as a whole. Over the long term, lasting impact will come from leaders who authentically create more value and purpose by demonstrating a wider concern for those who work for, with, and around them. Societal forces will be mirrored within the walls of your own organization more than ever. We have begun the next iteration of the ever-evolving discussion world on inclusion in our world. Discussions on inclusion, diversity, and equality in a corporate environment have long been a topic for discussion. But today, as communicators, it's our job to help create a tolerant and accepting force. force. One where we all are not just tolerant, but where we lean in and we foster cultures of being inclusive and encouraging diversities. Companies operating across borders need to understand how or if they can successfully operate in socio-economically and politically divided countries or in evolving political environments that are shifting towards nationalism or populism. Another aspect of this is the need for companies to anticipate and respond when individual employees take a visible public position that appears to contradict or even directly challenge the values for which the company um, exists. Many of you probably saw the recent steps taken by Google leadership in response to one of their engineers circulating a memo in which he suggested that the gender gap in the tech industry was at least partly caused by biological factors like women having lower stress tolerance and too much empathy. Within a matter of days, many Google leaders, including CEO Sundar Pinchai, had weighed in voicing opposition to the memo. Even though he ultimately determined that the memo violated Google's code of conduct by advancing harmful gender stereotypes, he still had to be artful in how he crafted his email to staff. With a subject line that, re that read, our words matter, he began by saying, we strongly support the right of Googlers to express themselves and much of what is in that fair to debate, fair to debate, regardless of whether a vast majority of Googlers disagree with it. But to suggest, he said, that a group of our colleagues have traits that make them less biologically suited to that work is offensive and it is not okay. It is contrary to our basic values and to our code of conduct. As professional communicators, we will often be called upon to counsel senior leaders on how to strike a balance be sh between showing respect for open dialogue and opinion, and opinion and having zero tolerance, excuse me, zero tolerance for discrimina discrimination or anti-inclusive action. Values equal valuation. Following our or your moral compass. In another balancing act, senior executives are increasingly consumed with the growing complexity of risk management, balanced with their pursuit of opportunity and relentless demands for high performance. Leaders who guide organizations successfully across the chasm of risk using the moral compass of their values have, re have really drawn on their organization's core strengths. Conversely, racing ahead at full speed and not making decisions consistent with an organization's core values can expose weaknesses that may deeply harm a company's valuation, especially in today's environment where the behaviors and integrity of the leader are seen by consumers are reflective of those of the greater company. Bell Pottinger is a very recent case in point. I'm sure most of you will have seen the coverage on their situation in recent days and weeks. Bell Pottinger, a very well-known and established PR firm, had been accused of using black ops social media campaigns to distract away from scandals surrounding 
the Gupta family and President Jacob Zuma in South Africa. The firm, after ending its dealings with the Gupta's investment firms in April, released an apology for its actions, saying rogue members in the firm launched the campaigns without management's knowledge. But by then, the damage was done and the fallout continued right to this week when Bell Pottinger finally went into administration. This is no time for hubris, and I take no joy in a competitor finding themselves in this situation. This is a reputational issue for our entire industry and for every single one of us in this room. I know that at Fleischmann-Hillard, and I assume and I know for so many other firms, this has served not only as an excellent reminder of why we must have such robust ethics policies and procedures in place, but also as a jumping off point for a broader dialogue on ethics and values. In the case of Bell Pottinger, it's frightening just how easy how easily social and digital media, which is a largely unregulated space, can so readily be used by so-called communications professionals in such an underhanded manner. Begs the next question. Whom do we believe? We used to think that the internet would lead to greater understanding. In reality, everyone now exists to some extent in their own echo chamber, commonly defined as the situation in which information, ideas, or beliefs are amplified or reinforced by transmission and repetition in size, an enclosed system where different or competing views are censored, disallowed, or otherwise underrepresented. Where does that leave the corporate communications person? Well, while well, Fleisch and Hillard's own research continues to validate that friends and family for the most trusted source of information for most people, the humble employee. We, the employees, appear to have become a notable brand hero in the quest for credible brand information in the sphere of corporate communications, now seen as three times more credible than what is said by the leaders of companies. Think of websites like Glassdoor.com, where employees at every level of an organization are given a platform to talk about their experiences working for a company and giving their feedback on whether an organization or leader is good or bad. Or think of companies that have a strong network of employee advocates who are happy to take to Twitter and fight back when they believe their company is under attack. Suddenly, your employees' perspectives on how well they're being treated by your company are amplified and being factored into the buying decisions of the general public. And the internet cannot sh shoulder all of the blame. Traditional media sources are playing a significant a significant role in enabling that echo chamber as well. There are several TV stations within steps of my desk in our corporate headquarters back in the United States. One of them is the CNN and another is onto Fox News. Fox News. I'm always amazed living in the United States when I walk by and see these two networks featuring the exact same story and drawing completely opposite conclusions. Where one station touts a policy as America first, the other derides this as un-American. Where one believes it has found a smoking gun, the other labels it, labels it merely as fake news. This probably wouldn't be so bad if every viewer had two televisions, tuning to two conflicting channels. At least then they might have the opportunity to make up their own decision based on both perspectives. But this is very rarely the case. I know there's going to be more about this tomorrow, but just let me touch on it. With the credibility we give to a message often being based on who is doing the communicating, friend, family member, employee, news anchor, we're now entering uncharted territory where with the rise of artificial intelligence, which we're going to need so much more about in 2018, and the rapid proliferation of AI bots taking over customer interactions, we will start giving, we need to start giving consideration to what no longer who, but what is doing the communicating. Whether you side with Elon Musk, who's been sounding alarm bells in recent days about the dangers of AI, or with Mark Zuckerberg, who sees the potential benefits as outweighing the risks, it is pretty clear that artificial intelligence is about to change our lives. A few weeks ago, the news broke that Disney was developing an AI that is trained to judge short works of fiction. With the help of a neural network, the system can use 
sample stories to recognise particular traits and patterns that would appeal to a broad range of readers. It's in its early stages, but with the investments that a company like Disney can put behind it, could it have the potential to one day become the storyteller rather than just the story and see So you can see how this trend can also lead to anxiety in our communications job market with the proliferation of news feed algorithms and automated journalism on the horizon. Factory workers aren't the only ones looking over as shoulders as robots and algorithms take on more jobs currently held by humans. And just as we worry about who or, in the case of AI and algorithms, what is curating the news we receive, we also need to pay close attention to how the sources are sorted and what filters are applied to the flow of information so we can avoid creating or winding up inside of what I might describe as a biased bubble. The more news we get from social media and the more we select and read stories that align with our personal views, the more our modern online tracking services and algorithms decide what we like to read and serve up content affected by that filter, effectively reading our stories that present any conflicting point of view. Similar to that echo chamber I touched on earlier, the price we pay for letting technology sort and filter our news for us is that we are presented with a worldwide view that does absolutely nothing to challenge our positions, further convincing our brains that the majority agrees with us and therefore we, I, must be right. This is another reason why fake news is a very real problem. There was a fascinating piece in the Guardian newspaper in the UK earlier this year titled The Truth About Brexit Didn't Stand a Chance in the Online Bubble, making the argument that Brexit were spurred on by a filter bubble. I believe this. In it, Aaron Banks, the wealthy donor partly responsible for the Brexit campaign, is quoted as saying, the Remain in the European Union campaign featured fact, 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 fact. And that just doesn't work anymore. You've got to connect with people emotionally. That is why the Leave campaign relied heavily on tapping into the raw emotional sentiment and paid less attention to the factual outcomes of the vote. And today, the people of the United Kingdom are becoming more emotional because the fact is that Britain has to loot shambles caused by the triumph, caused by the triumph of fake information on a grand scale that prevailed over all logic. The people of Britain voted for a future that is rooted in the past and voted for a past that has no future, frankly. Our challenge as ethical communicators in this world of filter bubbles will be how do we do both? How do we connect with people emotionally while remaining true to the facts? And what new challenges will we have in presenting those facts in a simulated environment? with an increasing number of consumers showing high levels of interest in virtual reality and augmented reality, it's safe to say that these technologies are moving beyond mere novelty and into the mainstream. There is little doubt that VR and AR will change how we share information and understand the world. And we as communicators are being challenged with learning a new way to present a highly realistic experience in our communications. With virtual reality, live events can be shared by millions simultaneously around the globe, and everything that happens within a 360-degree field of view will be part of that experience. Augmented reality is also gaining momentum as we continue finding more interesting ways to overlay digital information on top of the world around us. Consider this, it took Facebook one year to grow to 50 million users. The augmented reality game Pokemon Go had 50 million users in a mere 19 days. VR and AR will affect everyone from corporate and product events, plant tours or meetings to customer service inquiries, employee training and trade shows. It can deliver a high definition, simultaneously shared experience to people on opposite sides of the world. We know today it's going to be big and it's going to connect people across the office and across the world in ways we have not yet begun to imagine. So, will everyone benefit equally? Will technology be a solution if national borders become
barriers. Given the number of people who have international connections and so and the number who already conduct cross-border business online, will the very nature, very nature and relevance of physical borders be challenged? <laughs> How will leaders manage their businesses when a headquarters is based in one country but their presence, whether that be physical or technological, is found in multiple countries where the same emphasis may not be placed on similar values or ethical principles? There was a time when a company's brand image might be controlled with enough marketing budget and a catchy message. These days are long gone as reputation, what others say about you, has as much or more weight than what you say about yourself. Companies need to embrace this reality and embrace it now. Operate in transparent and authentic ways and align all aspects of their business with what the consumer expects. We are required more and more to have a working knowledge of every new trend touching the way people communicate. Because like social media a few years ago or the internet before that, any one of those trends has the potential to dramatically transform our industry. The list of eight forces to watch in 2018 that I've just gone through covers quite a broad range of disciplines, rapidly evolving technologies, and big ideas that I don't pretend are mine. In a lot of ways, they also describe the trajectory of our profession. It's not enough anymore to know how to place a story or to write a press release. Our you, our clients, and those of us who are in the agency business, we are all in the same boat. There was a time when a company's brand image might be controlled with a big enough marketing budget and a catchy message. Those days are long gone, as reputation, what others say about you, has as much more weight as I've already said. And consumers are able to join the conversations in ways that are easier, more plentiful, and more amplified than ever before. So how do we cope with this new and daunting reality? By picking up the thread that runs through it all, which is in the importance of making ethical, values-based decisions in the face of whatever challenge is put in front of us. For companies, that means embracing the new reality, operating in transparent and authentic ways, that word authentic once again, and aligning all aspects of their business with what the consumer expects. For communicators, it means taking a stand for what's right, being seen as the kind of person or organization with whom others want to do business. Because at the end of the day, all you have is your reputation. What I I've learned through my experience with Van Morrison, but also the course of my career in the communications industry is this. If you let your decisions be guided by unwavering ethical principles and clear values, and you act with courage and speed in the face of any challenge, then it doesn't matter what the future throws at you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you so much, John. If I'm just ask you to do, remain on stage. Well, I invite uh, Ipshita Sen, the head of consumer practice at Ad Factors, to come on stage and have a conversation with John. Interesting, John, both you and, you and Dr. Ram before you. Uh, both of you spent quite a bit of time talking about ethics and how that was really important for communicators. So, you know, Ad Factors is a quite a large firm and getting the sorts of young people working. So I'm asking this question on their behalf, really. When, and lots of them here as well, when are you, you know, a few years into your career? How do you really stand up for yourself in ethics? Well, there are a few things there. First of all, it's uh, important to divide ethics between something you don't just agree with. And 
we all face situations in our work life that we're not going to agree with the direction that our uh, boss is going or our clients going. Um, and ultimately, we can advise, um, but that is their right. But I think it's incredibly important when it comes to uh, ethical issues, uh, and there are so many of them in business today that we've got to deal with. Um, it is imperative that one stands up and says that, I'm sorry, I, I can't do this. And even if, even if it comes at a very short term and high cost, in the long term it is the right thing to do. And it can be very, it can be very painful, um, but it is important, no matter what the financial cost. There's a moral aspect to it. Uh, there's also the very practical aspect of it that you might go to jail, depending on how severe it is. And don't be into ever lulled into a false sense of security that uh, because it's acceptable in a business today or in a country today, it may not be acceptable in five years' time. It may not be acceptable in ten years' time. And we've seen in many parts of the world, be it those who behave badly in politics, those who behaved in badly in business, their past catches up with them. And they end up in jail. I also happen to believe that if they don't end up in jail in this life, it may not be great in the next life either. So I think it's really, I think it's, it's very fundamental. Very important, I think, and, and I'm sure uh, kids here are going to take note of that. Uh, just to look at communications and the role of the communicator from another angle, right? We spend most of our lives, whether we are or, you know, at, at the corporate comms side as client or, or in the agency, we are mostly amplifying brand messages and protecting brand reputation, building brand reputation, etc. How important do you think it is also for the communicator to play back some of the market sentiment, some of the feedback that, that they're getting? I think in uh, in all aspects of life, it's important uh, to um, pick one's battles. Uh, but I, I would always hope that as a consultant that you are giving honest uh, feedback and present it in a way that is hopefully positive and, uh, and uh, informed and constructive. Uh, I, I, I absolutely understand I'm sure so many people in the room uh, will echo it. I've, I've had it so many times in my life that um, I don't always appreciate it. I remember when I was much, much younger back in Ireland um, and working for a hotel group. And in front of the managers, I, I told the new general manager that I'd stayed in a couple of his hotels and I didn't think they were very good. Um, and he took me into his office later on. He said, if you want to keep this account, you never, ever criticize our hotels. Um, so there are risks involved. Um, but I, I think that if you're worthy of the name consultant, um, then you, you've, got to, you've got to provide the feedback. But it's also really important. You have to earn that right. You can't walk in on the first day um, and start telling everybody what you think is best. It's about building uh, trust uh, that the people that you're talking to believe that it's incompetent and also it's increasingly important that the feedback is based upon really good um, certainly a lot of the companies that we're working for now um, sometimes the response is well actually with respect John we don't really care about your opinion unless you can tell us that it's based upon data. And then you take out the information and say, well, actually, this is what's being said. So it's really important to have your facts. So be brave, but know what you're talking about. Precisely. I'm going to ask you one more question and then throw it open for the audience. 
In the trends that you were talking about, the trends to look out for, you talked about AI, you talked about VR, VR and, and I mean, we know, right, uh, that uh, bots are going to be answering your phone calls and things like that going forward. <laughs> Technology going to take over the role of the communicator? Is there something that we need to prepare for? Your, what do you think? No, I, I, I'm personally not a, at all concerned um, about the future or the shift in technologies because I think that um, the reputation of individuals, the reputation of corporations, of organizations, paramount, will become increasingly paramount. Um, I'm only concerned if and when we don't have professionals uh, who, who are pretending to understand the technology and don't really understand the technology, um, or that our firms or our co corporate communications departments are populated by people who have either no experience, uh, I don't, no experience is not the same thing uh, as I, I believe completely in giving and encouraging young people to play, take on very key roles, um, but, but people have to have experience, have to know what they're talking about. And once we, once we continue to do that, um, there's a rich future for our um, business. But sometimes there are people out there who seem to think it can be done um, by either very junior people or um, people who frankly are not that competent. And I'm sure there are roles for those people, but not in terms of giving the kind of advice that the world's leading corporations, I believe, seek. Audience, do we have questions for John? Come on, wake up. Yeah, there's one, one here. Do you want to introduce yourself, sir, before I ask? Hi, uh, John. I'm, uh, I'm Jay. I work with AdFactors and uh, uh, I run with the digital communications team. Um, the question I had, and we've had this discussion in the past uh, across multiple forums, but the issue of PR managers having, or not PR managers, but the business, either having a bad reputation in terms of people don't know what we do, or people think it's evil. How do you solve it? How do you become a brand ambassador for PR itself? Brand ambassador for PR consultancies? So people think that maybe it's not so cool to work in PR. Or they don't so know the what PR is. is. Not I, I can hear the sound. What, what's the question again? That maybe people think that it's not so cool to work in PR, just PR and brand ambassadors. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, not so it's a, well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're even having this huge debate that's been going for a long time about whether we should call it PR anymore. And we've... Um, with Fred Cook yesterday um, in Delhi and saying the majority of people no longer believe it, it should be called public relations. I mean, public relations was, I think, considered a pretty noble profession, probably until uh, the time of President Nixon and all the scandals in the United States, and then suddenly PR began to become associated with um, lies and spin and, and all of that. Um, I personally am comfortable with uh, the words public relations because I think it goes to the essence of uh, relationships. I'm less comfortable with communications because I think it's more about just messaging, which I think is a couple of tiers down from where public relations should be. Um, I, I, think that, I think that we do um, have an issue with our reputation. But I think lawyers do too. Uh, some, I think accountants are regarded as boring. Um, I think journalists have issues with their reputation. Um, I, I'm, um, I mean, lots of other smarter, brighter people are more obsessed with that topic than I am. Um, I, I'm, I, I think we're doing, I think we're doing great work. Um, well, I think there's, I think one of the, one of the challenges we have is to make sure in countries like India that best talent come into PR firms and they just don't all go in-house. Um, that, that's a challenge. That's not just a challenge in India, it's a challenge in South Africa, in a whole bunch of other countries. Um, and, and we've got to make sure that we continue to give people a great 
um, career experience. I hope that someone answers your question. Do we have another question? Yeah. Hi. Um, we talked about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, we spoke how Disney is working on an app which would soon be uh, working on... Um, uh, Sorry, we can't... You're not clear. Can you speak up a bit, please? Hello? Yeah. Is it better? We spoke about artificial intelligence and um, how Disney is working on an app about uh, how artificial intelligence will be uh, uh, helping them in future about storytelling. So it's more about a concern uh, than a question. Uh, do you think it, it, it's, uh, it's going to pose a challenge to uh, communication experts? Would it make us uh, dispensable? Because storytelling is also going to be taken care of by artificial intelligence in future. So if, fear, if you're sitting up here, I'm sorry, there's a big echo, so it's quite hard. So if storytelling is going to be taken over by artificial intelligence, then what about communicators, right? Yes, yes. So what's the role of... Yeah, I mean, I think this is, um, you know, I say this is a, a, a concern uh, in, in the future, but I, uh, I, and I think it is going to dramatically change much of uh, what goes on. Um, but I, in the end of the day, I see it as just another opportunity. There's so much has changed in the last uh, decade that people said was going to put us at risk. I, um, and uh, I, I don't think this will. I mean, there's going to be, there's going to be changing roles. We now people coming into the broader communications industry who are coming from a math background rather than an arts background. Um, and because we're, we're needed to match creativity and science. And this is going to be another aspect of the science side of it. So we're going to need more scientists maybe on that side of it. But we've got to, we, we're always going to have to have that balance between the, the, the creative types, um, the great writing, the great content as well, and then those in our industry who really get the geeks, the people who really get the technology. So I, I, I I hope, I believe, being naive, but I, I hope it's just another opportunity for us. So, John, since we have minutes left, I'm going to ask the last question on behalf of, again, young people. The role of the communicator, staying true to the calling of communications, how do you, what advice do you have to, for them to, when, they, you know, when they're thinking about building career paths? What are some of the things to keep in mind? Well, what I would like to do is just to echo about what you said earlier on, about people building careers. Um, I think tempt real, there's a real temptation in India right now, and I understand it, I get it, I really get it. I understand there's a temptation to keep moving jobs for the immediate need with satisfaction that comes with um, an extra few thousand rupees or whatever it might be. And then to move on to the next job. And so you end up at the age of 33 or 34, and you might have jobs, jobs, and you're quite well paid, but you've actually got to a point where you've priced yourself out of the market because you've kept changing jobs, but you actually haven't built a career. And you haven't built any real sustained experience. And I would just say, be careful of that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and pontificate to anybody about you shouldn't strive to earn more money, you shouldn't strive to do better for yourself or to, for your family. But get the balance right between when is the right time to move on. I mean, I, I've stayed with time because, I mean, I started out from a very, very small country in a very, very small business. With a, in the, when I showed you the, 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 the picture of, um, of me in my first year in the, in the business, uh, that business that I ran earned $50,000 in a whole year. Um, and now I work for something that's considerably larger than that. But I made constant decisions to stay with Fleischmann Hillard 
because they, they treated me. And whether it's Fleischmann Hillard or Ad Factors or working for one of the great corporates here or um, the great Prima Sager with, um, with Genesis Burson Marsteller or Rob's firm or Guillaume's firm or any of these great firms, you just have to um, ask yourself the question about, you know, am I better staying here? Can I develop my career here rather than just keep <laughs> Just say that with, with uh, respect. Thank you. Very insightful, and I'm sure people are going to take away a lot of things today. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very John. much. Thank you.